You are listening to the Legendarium Blue Team. You have chosen wisely. Go to patreon.com slash legendarium to support the show. I'm so proud of you. You've come so far in your sense of self-awareness. Thank you, Ken. I'm just, I'm just saying, but <laughs> I'm not that chauvinistic. More chivalrous. Anyway, <laughs> this, how did this become about me? You're it the was, one talking. It was just oh easy, Ken. It was just easy. I hate you all so much. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Now you know what Craig deals with all the time. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. This is episode 198. For those of you out in Vegas who were saying to, this, to yourselves, I'm going to put a bet that they're never going to make it to episode 200. You are about to lose your money, brother, <laughs> because we are going steamroller full speed ahead toward episode 200. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I am your blue team host, Todd Wenty, and we're going to try something. Uh, people have been complaining about the fact that there have been no insults on the blue team podcast. We are a kinder, gentler podcast, but in the effort of trying to give people what they really want, here we go. Here we go. He is... <laughs> I'm going to try oh, this. Man, I thought y'all liked each other too much through the, to insult each other. get through them without laughing. <laughs> Over there, he is so old, he makes Bob look youthful. He's Ken Johnson. Bob. <laughs> Bob was a child. And between us, <laughs> she was growing up. I got, I got nothing. <laughs> and between us, she is so sweet, she could banish a demon with just her smile. It's Megan Smythe. And I have, several yeah. times. You notice I can't even, I don't do insults very well, at least no, not when it comes fine. to Megan. I am going to find better insults for you, though, Ken. We'll give it a shot. We'll, we'll just leave it to Craig. He's got such a hateable heart. We'll give it to, we'll give it a shot. Um, and of course, <laughs> everybody knows, does that mean I'm going to give his heart a shot? I'm uh, gonna, yeah. Wait, what? Maybe, never mind. Never mind. Right. Uh, I would come up with an insult for myself, but I'm just too doggone smart and handsome. Um, so as far as housekeeping. Yeah, that was right. <laughs> I tried to move that one right along before anything went wrong. This with is that. what happens oh, when you was... can't see yourself in the mirror. Oh, wow. You're welcome. That was beautiful. Okay, Megan Thanks. is now in charge of all oh, of the insults no. this about is Todd. Terrible. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. Patreon.com slash uh, forward slash legendarium. If you want to show some support to the show, we always appreciate that. For those of you who do on a continual basis, thank you so much. Uh, this is, the, we exist because of you. Uh, and we are thrilled to be able to continue to support this community and to give you what you enjoy, which is sci fi and fantasy conversation. So. Hallelujah. Legendarium.reddit.com if you want to engage with us on or offline. Uh, and then if you want to reach any of us, you can uh, email us, Todd, Megan, or Ken at thelegendariumpodcast.com. It's a great email. You can also catch us Megan's on Twitter or Facebook. Got an email. Yeah, I got an email account. You've got an email account. Legit. Now you just have to use it. Like oh, I Craig keeps telling it. me. Yeah, it's just kind of one of those things. So today we are reviewing the first installment in the Dresden Files. We're reviewing Stormfront. And now... Megan and Ken have both been through this before. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is your second time through. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, for me, this is my first time through, and I have to admit, we've been uh, we've been trying to line up the Dresden Files here on the Legendarium for about two and a half years. We've been talking about it for eh, probably around there. It's, it's, yeah. it's been it's a while. Been, it's been on the radar for a while. It's been a while. But um, between Sanderson things and, and you know, our year of Cosmere and all of the... Wheel of Time. Uh, yeah, and the oh, Wheel of Time and everything. It's just, it's been, you know, hard to get to it because there's been so much good stuff. And now that we have, now that we have the blue team, the blue team is actually able to 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 put us into a place where we can explore these new pieces. Right. <laughs> which is, which Those is, are more classic. Which yes. is kind of our design, you yeah. know, of red team and blue team. That we Absolutely. Can yeah. tackle more stuff. And uh, and this this gets us into our first foray into urban fantasy, which I've been pushing for. Oh a my long goodness, time. there's so much fun, and and we're, we we want we probably as, as we go through this, we're going to be talking about a whole different uh, or a whole bunch of different kinds of subjects and topics, uh, including I, I hope we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about the Dresden Files television series, um, and and talk about some of the comparisons that we might find that we might draw. Um, we'll have a lot of fun. This is going to be and this is going to be a series. We're not going to go through all of the Dresden Files books. 
Um, I think we're not at all least, at once. Not all at yeah. once. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably do, I think we're planning on doing like three or four this first run through. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then we'll probably pick up along the way. We'll do some more at, a, at another time. So those of you that are, that are excited about us doing the Dresden Files, don't worry. We're going to, we're going to make sure you get lots of Jim Butcher along the way. I yeah. think I, yeah. I stopped at three, the first, my first read through, which was a huge mistake. Cause I feel like the end of three is sort of like pushing you towards the next book. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping yeah. we can get at least a four. There you go. And that that's a lot uh, that was a lot of discussion among people who were pushing us to do the Dresden files yeah. is the first some people say the first 3, some people say after the first one, the first 5, it, it starts to pick up. And if my memory serves, about book 3 is yeah. where it starts to pick up, but I enjoyed books 1 and 2 as well. So you, it's not like you can't enjoy those. It's not like you have to slog through them. In, right. Indeed. And, and yeah. honestly, they're fast reads. And oh, I appreciate that it I mean, we we can get to this later, but I appreciate that this first book is not an origin story. It it jumps right into the middle of it where the stuff has happened. He catches you up, but stuff has happened, and then things go forward. But he just kind of he cool. already's got relationships with Murphy and would, would you like Morgan? And would you like to hear about the stuff that happens? Let's 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 have Ken do our do our intro, shall oh, yeah. we? Yeah, okay. okay. Ken has a, Ken has a summary for us. Um, I can't believe I forgot about that. Here here we go. Insert obligatory. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> quote here because why not Hagrid hi Harry uh, Potter I, Harry Tretton this is the better Harry wizard honestly mm-hmm. Okay, Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden is a real-life, pure-hearted, chivalrous wizard complete with rough edges, a demon encyclopedia living in a skull, and a fairy godmother. Harry's a mysterious guy <laughs> with a lot of secrets in his past, one of which gets him in trouble with the wizard ruling council when a couple of people end up with their insides on their outside. The cops want him to help figure out who whammied them. Only one small problem, the White Castle, uh, the White Council, White Castle's a totally different thing. White yeah. Castle's bad movie. Yeah. The White Council thinks it's Harry, and an overzealous warden with a massive Harry grudge is going to prove it. Okay, so several problems. He's on a pretty short credibility leash with the Chicago PD and Sergeant Karen Murphy, who's head of the Special Investigations Unit, who keeps trying to arrest him. And his investigation gets him squarely on the radar of Chicagoland crime boss gentleman John Marconi. And, oh yeah, that uh, there's a vampire owner of a local brothel who now wants to eat him. Literally. So there's that. Yeah. But Harry sets out to figure out who, how, and why someone is turning people's hearts into modern Jackson Pollock knockoffs. <laughs> Meanwhile. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. A nervous woman shows up at Harry's office asking for his help in locating her mysteriously missing husband. Oh, and some mysterious drug has shown up on the street that gives users of the site into magic land with only minor side effects of driving them crazy. But the missing Sploding Hearts Club and the crazy drug can't possibly all be connected, right? You fools. Turns out <laughs> the missing husband is actually a black wizard wannabe who's being backed by a deep pockets couple that's producing the three eyed drug. And he's using storms and orgies because why not to blow people up as a way to clear the path for the drug and get some cash for the power of and, and power for his efforts. Long story short, Harry's the superior wizard. The bad wizard gets melted by his own demons. Folks go to jail. The bad guy's family is now safe. Wizard cop sees Harry save people and lets him off the hook grudgingly. Murphy now likes Harry well. Sort of, mm-hmm. but, you can, but you can totally see it coming, right? So go team, good guy. All is right with the world until book two. All right. So we got questions. Everything was wrapped up pretty nicely, but here are a couple of questions for you. One, where did Victor Sells learn magic? This was a question on Reddit, so I'm throwing it right in there. Where did Victor Sells learn magic? It's a simple matter of him. Is it a simple matter of him getting curious in an occult book or is there some Chicago library for the maniacally inclined? I, you know, how, how many books until Harry gives Murphy an annual pass to the wizarding world of Harry Dresden? Because that's going to happen. <laughs> that just right? sounds dirty. That just sounds <laughs> dirty. It was supposed to be a universal studios, you know, a theme park thing, but yeah, I given, think it goes to a different given studio. The, way that the Dresden files, you know, was written. Eh, it, it could go either way. Yeah, yeah, prettier uh, and Scorpion. A scorpion or scorpion or I don't scorpionish. All right. So anyway, he's going to let her he's going to let her in on the magic world eventually. You know, he is uh, because she has to be in order to remain a sustainable character. Uh, Harry has gotten himself into trouble by killing his former master in self-defense. Is that true or is there something more to this story? Well, I, I've, I, I have a feeling we'll find out. We'll find out. Several elements were set in motion in this story. Where does the next big trouble come from? Those are the questions I come up. So. Let's get to it. And for Christmas, I'm getting each of you a bob and a skull. 
Oh, oh. I love it. I'm going to be no. so happy about that. Yeah. I don't need somebody watching me in my apartment. You can cover him with a with a cloth. You Just, can ask him any question you want. He knows lots. Yeah, but Ooh. he'll also give you sarcastic answers all the time. Kind of like having Ken live in the house. Never mind. We're uh, not going to go there. Jolene will probably. Oh, wait. Place. I gave away a name. Sorry about remember, that. If, <laughs> we'll bleep that out in like editing, won't we? <laughs> hey, remember, if I can see you, you can see. If you can see me, I can see you. If you can't see me, I can still see you. <laughs> so, and I'm out. So, creepy, uh, creepy, creepy. So let's, so let's talk about this. All right. Um, before we get into some of the questions that, that, that our Redditors have brought up, let's talk about the, about the book itself. Um, about the read, about how we, about what we enjoyed about it, what maybe what we didn't enjoy about it. Um, Megan, why don't you start? This is your again, your second time through. Yes. Okay. I will be honest. I did not remember. I I was reading it again, and just it was all new again. I remembered almost nothing about it. I remember things about like the three books I read, kind of as a conglomeration, but not really anything specific. I just kind of remembered that I had a vague feeling of dissatisfaction. So why I suggested we read this, I'm not exactly sure, except I knew that you would love it. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it a lot more the second go around. I think my frustration um, came from, I get really tired of the world weary first person point of view. Okay. Yeah. But during this read, I really enjoyed more the sense of humor and his, he really has a he has an oddly positive outlook on things, even if he's very aware of how much his life kind of sucks. Cynically optimistic. That's a good phrase. Yeah. I like to think of him as pragmatic. I I I, I think know. he's I I think he's a little bit more than pragmatic. I think he's I mean I agree that he's that he's very pragmatic about the way especially the way that he uses magic. Yeah. Um it's a it's a very pragmatic kind of a thing because it's part of who he is. But yeah, he does have he does have a kind of you're right. It's weirdly that's that was the phrase that came into my mind was cynically optimistic. He's very cynical about the world, but he's optimistic about the fact that the world can be a good place. Right, and he's but he's also very aware that the world can be a really crappy place, and he's one of those people trying to infuse some yeah some positivity. Like his random, I want to be a gentleman to the people around to the women around me, regardless of whether they want that. Like it was, right. it was kind of nice. Like it was kind of sweet that he acknowledged that that was something that mattered to him. He's a gentleman chauvinist. Just a little bit. A gent- as opposed I to a gentleman a bastard. Chauvinist. Oh, that was a plug for what Red's what's coming, coming up from Red yeah. Team. Yeah, there you go. Wah, wah. They owe us for that. They um, owe us for that. Yeah, but I, I like the style. It was, it was interesting reading that last chapter where it kind of wraps everything up and I read it and I thought this pretty much you could just read this as a, um, like it's a TV show and this is somebody reading kind of in the background while you see all this montage of, and this happy picture and this happy picture, and th- which yes. was it's... a little bit distracting for me, but uh, like, you know, it was more his thought process and less like conversations and showing. No. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It was telling, not showing, but I, I enjoyed it overall. Looking okay. Forward to the next one. Cam, what about you? I think this was a very fine example of where first person actually works. Uh-huh. Very well for me. I'm not typically one who likes first person books. That was one of the things I didn't quite like about the Red Rising series. I love the Red Rising series. Um, But when we were complaining about the unreliable narrator and everything, that's that's one of the main reasons I don't like the first person um, narration. But in this, because this is a textbook crime drama, a a detective drama, you know, um, Mickey Spillane, those kind of things where, you know, I... I, I stopped by the office at 2 p.m., you know, and she was sitting there, that sort of, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. And, <laughs> and uh, where it's basically like a running diary of what the main character is doing. And so it works. And then you throw in the, the magic, which I mean, we all like the magic and the magic systems and the magic worlds. This is the, clearly a first of the series. I mean, in the sense that it, it basically hits every checkpoint along the way. I mean, the the magic is basic. You know, there's there's vampires. There's a lot of basic level Trusty stuff. Trusty people helping him out. Yeah, and at the end of the book, it kind of wraps everything up like like an episode. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, it's very episodic in nature. And the next few are the same way. It, I know, you know, from reading a couple of books on, I, I know it starts to build into grander world building stuff. This one does not, and that's fine. It's a first. It, it, it's the first of a series, and so it doesn't need to be, but. But I think, you know, aside from the formulaic nature of it, this book really engaged me. And mainly because Harry is, I think, a great character. So have either of you actually read any of the Mickey Spillane uh, mystery books? Mm -mm. No. 
So I read several when I was younger. Um, in my in in my early years, my 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 teen early teenage years, uh, I found at my grandparents' house. This probably is just really bad, uh, <laughs> but I but I found at my grandparents' house several old Mickey Spillane uh, murder mystery novels. No, uh, uh, and and I I pulled them out and I asked my grandma, you know, can I have these? You know, can I read these? Would that be okay? She's like, well, let's ask your mom. And my mom was like, I don't care. Uh, and so, and so I, and I just ate them up. I loved them. Uh, and back, uh, back in the day when Stacy Keach, uh, was doing the Mickey's Blaine te- I, television series. Mike Hammer. Yeah. I watched those. I loved them. Uh, I, I was very, I really enjoyed them. Absolutely wrapped in by this world of this, uh, of, of the, of the, the kind of film noir, um, anti-hero you mm-hmm. know I, i'm a hero but i don't really want to be i just i'm just trying to make rent mm-hmm. um kind of a feeling and as 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 well as that was done this book J, jim butcher's writing really does a wonderful job of channeling that but putting that new spin on it with the with the magic system um yeah and i was i was very i was very pleased um because it had the same feel throughout it never felt like it all of a sudden made the jump into uh, a fantastical, a wizard is a wizard whenever he wants to be a wizard. You know, I, I never felt like we were going into some kind of uh, grand melodrama. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, it felt very much like these were these were real people living in a in a modern kind of a situation where we've got a juxtaposition of a, a world that we're familiar with and a world that we wish we were familiar with. Um, yeah. And those pieces yeah. laying over the top of each other was was just a lot of fun to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I want to, that I want to touch on before we go very far, uh, is, was what you thought about what he was doing with world building. Did he do enough? Did he do too little in this first book to, from a standpoint of being able to set the stage and being able to make everything believable and work for you? Um, yes, he, he did Okay, no, you can't say yes to yes. an or question. Yes. Yes. He did enough. Yes. I think, yes, he did enough for the first book of what we know is a 15 book series already. You know what I mean? If this was the first book and we were just leaving it at that, it'd be like, I I'd like some more, but we know that this is building to a larger thing. And all, all he's giving are little breadcrumbs. You know, we, we get a mention of the never, never, which is the, the magic land. You know, we get a mention of there are demons. We get to see a vampire. We get to we meet one random fairy. Yeah. We meet one random toot, fairy toot. toot toot. Well, and, and one random demon who spits, you know, uh, acid at you. It's, you know, and we, and we get to see a scorpion grow into the size of a, a terrier. And, okay. And that's something I hope I never, ever see on the big screen. Cause that was just icky. I did think it was interesting though. Uh, it, if anybody has ever lived in a place where there are a lot of scorpions, you know that the bigger, the less poisonous. Like if you see tiny baby scorpions, they're way more poisonous than the bigger ones, except if they're magic, apparently. Yep. Yes. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I, I The one thing I did like, and I, I thought of this, especially based on um, when Craig Ryan and Kyle talked about uh, the second book of the Gentleman Bastard sequence, they were talking about the magic system and, and how it was hard or soft and, you know, in terms of hard magic is where the, you know, the rules are, are very clearly defined. This is what you can do. These are the rules you have to follow. Soft magic is like Harry Potter, where you can basically do whatever you need to mm-hmm. in order to make the narrative work. And I think that Jim Butcher does a fantastic job of kind of blending the two. Everything yeah. is, is set and very clearly defined. And he goes through, I need to do these steps in order to make this happen. You, he, there are a lot of things that he can do based on, where the narrative needs to take them, but each one of them have rules set uh, to guide those. It's not just, and now I need to conveniently do this. Yeah. You know? Well, there's, yeah. there's some of that, but there's also some, there's also some questionability about that. Sorry, Megan, I'll get back to you in a second on this one. Um, the, the, because the, the piece that I'm thinking about is there seem to be different kinds of, he's, he's already introducing the idea that there are different kinds of magic Mm-hmm. that wizards can perform there there are potions yes and potions are done one way there are spells and spells are done a different way there are mm-hmm. different kinds of rules that govern those and then there are enchanted items which i love i love it and he gives he gives this gloss over 
uh, in the book. I I don't carry very I I don't I, I don't have very many enchanted items. Actually, they're almost half enchanted because it takes a long time to make them, and I don't have that kind of patience. Yes, uh, which I loved. I I kind of I kind of got a kick out of that. But but there is an uh, he he introduces the rules for spells and he introduces the rules for potions, but he doesn't really introduce the rules for enchanted items. And I'm really interested about how he's going to create this. Largely for me, it's it's around the idea of um, the the thing that started me thinking about this, and I never got over it. So I, it, I stay, it stayed with me, and I'm hoping that we get a chance to see a little bit more about this. It's the handkerchief that yeah. stored oh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of sunlight that he might need for a for a cloudy day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm kind of like, all right, how do you- I mean, how do you store sun, sunlight in a handkerchief? I I I want to I I want to know. Thinking it's a tiny yeah. little spell. You know, inquiring yeah. minds want to know, and I'm sure I'm sure he's got that worked out. Um, I'm sure it's a I'm I'm sure there are rules, but I'm wondering if in his writing, um, if this was a spot that he came to and he said, hmm, yeah, I want to do this. I have no clue what I'm going to do with it yet, so I'm just going to say that I did this, and we'll come back to it later when I figured it out. Yeah. That yes, I will. I will stipulate that is a good point. So that piece of that piece of world building was a was a piece that it feels like he's done a he's done a lot with a little bit mm-hmm. uh, with a couple of things to give enough credibility, but he hadn't fleshed everything out. Maybe because he didn't know the book was going to be successful. Maybe because he just didn't know how much he was going to have to do with it. You know, sure. maybe maybe it was an experiment. And he was going to figure it out. I don't know. Um, but but that was the that was the. It, it feels very much like the world, he's got some boundaries built around the world and how that works, but he's not explored them all to the point where they are, where he's ready to explore them and, and, and share them with all of us. Right. We're going to get bits and pieces. Um, yeah. Megan, what did you think as far as, as far as his world building, other things that uh, maybe came to your mind? Oh, I was a big fan of the way he weaved in and out of the real world and like how he interacted with people in the real world, because he's the only wizard in Chicago. So pretty much everybody that he we talks know to is well that he knows of that um, that makes himself known. Yes, right. That's a good point. Um, but he he has interactions with Murphy, who knows that something's up. But I don't. <laughs> it sounds like she does kind of believe in magic, and at the same time, she's not about to be like, "Hey guys, I really," you know, she's not right. about to announce it. And then you have someone like Susan who. Goes on this adventure and then writes it up for she works everybody at the Daily to Skeptic see. or whatever for the it's yeah, like it's, that's what it's called. I Thank like you. that the magic system is not being hidden from the people around him. He's not yeah. trying to keep it secret, and they don't have like some secret society covering everything up after it happens. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I I like that a lot of it takes pieces from things that are familiar from other magic systems and just kind yeah. of puts them all together. And, and really, I, I think if we're going to be talking about a, uh, about an urban fantasy, mm-hmm. um, then pulling things that are, f- that are familiar, that we've heard before, that we're, that we've been mm-hmm. made aware of, you know, the, the, he makes a, he makes a reference at one point, there can never be more than 13. Well, why can there never be more than 13? Most of us would go, Oh yeah, I totally understand why there couldn't be more than 13. 13 <laughs> is that witchy number, you know? Yeah. I mean, right. it's unlucky. There's there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things that he can hit on that we say oh yeah that totally makes sense because we hear these things whispered around all the time right yeah right so Whether let's go ghost let's, stories or campfire stories and that sort yeah of exactly yeah. exactly or you know uh, ne- necromicon anyway uh, we're not gonna the go necronomicon there. necronomicon there, there we go. go yeah we're not gonna talk about ash today okay. um, let's go back to one of the questions that was asked by one of our redditors about uh, how did Victor Sells become a wizard. Yeah, do you guys I thought, I thought that was a great question, and that that's my party pastor, by the way, which is a. Hey. I, I always love redditor names. I'm always shout interested. out. Oh. But yeah, they they <laughs> asked the thoughts on on Victor Sells and where he learned this stuff, being vague as possible. You know, they were being vague as possible because of spoilers. But guess what? Spoilers bound. So yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. We're I, okay, how did but... he just magically come up with the formula for one eye, three eye, three eye? Well, I, and I, I don't remember if it was him or if it was the, the two that he was partying with. We'll, we'll call it that. That uh, I think it was him. Sporting with. Yeah. Uh, because sporting. His sporting <laughs> with. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Sorry. Tangent. I'm coming back. All right. And um, there you are. There we are. But well, but his his <laughs> wife mentioned that he he had gotten into, you know, books and stuff like, ooh, magic. I'm I'm interested in learning more magic. Yeah. And, he, and and Well, it he becomes... sounds like one of those guys who's always looking for the next big pitch, like, oh, I'm going yeah. to try this and I'll get rich this way. And oh, I'm gonna try this and I'm gonna get rich this way. And oh, magic. Yeah. Multi- Nobody does this. Multi level magic rich and making. Then yeah. I'll be powerful <laughs> and I can MLM. do whatever I want. He's got lots of different magic users in his downline. <laughs> right. But, but it, it sounds like and I mean, I, you can kind of see where, you know, a little bit of power and this is this is common. This is yeah. common science fiction fantasy right. stuff where a little bit of power becomes intoxicating and they want more power and you got to figure out how to get the more yeah. power. And then you if you get into the wrong sort of magic, then all of a sudden you dive deeper. And now it's it's not just being mean. It's getting into orgies and it's now I'm afraid for my children. What is going what is he going yeah. to do in the name yeah. of power? And yeah, because, again, the magic is not. The, in in this situation is not necessarily a secret. So he might have stumbled on, like read something in the arcane and said, I don't know, maybe this is plausible. And then yeah. found out like yeah. maybe he had done something before because he had natural talent. Just walks into an occult start, bookstore or something, you know, something. He, you he, know, he looked at a bookstore and read something and said, like, oh, this, I don't know. I have nothing to lose. As I recall, one of the things, and I'm, and I apologize. I, again, uh, as, as most of our listeners will be aware, I, I listen to the, I listen to our books um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little overtaxed as far as time. And so my, my car becomes my library. James Marsters, by the way. Oh my goodness. Oh, what, what a, a great, what a, what a great narration. Yeah. Um, in if, fact, if you don't know Spike from Buffy, the vampire slayer, yeah. that's, that's James Marsters, man. He is, he just does such a fantastic job. He, with... he, did, he was, one, in fact, um, I've met Jim butcher mm-hmm. and it took me a little while to figure out whether it was Jim butcher reading his own stuff or if it was somebody else, because he, he sounds, read it with an American accent? He reads it with an American accent, yeah. and he sounded a lot like Jim Butcher. And so I was like, is this Jim doing his own? No, it's Jim. Wow, I'm impressed. So I'm, I, I was very pleased. It was very well done. Um, and just, and, and, and very well characterized. Yeah. Um, uh, going back, though, to, to how Victor Sells comes upon this, I, I don't think, for me at least, it was a stretch to accept the fact that um, that you can find these kinds of things if you're looking for them. Yes. And so, and it seemed like it, it, it I, Megan, as you were, as you were talking about, it, it seems like there's a, a reference to the fact that he was looking. Um, right. He never thought he was making enough money. So he was always trying to do something. And um, I, I think one of the things that, at, at least for me, that, that, that rings true about this kind of urban fantasy approach uh, is that I know people who are uh, who are practicing Wiccan. Mm-hmm. Um, I know individuals who um, channel uh, and and practice the art of channeling uh, based on uh, belief systems that are that would be considered occult or arcane. And so it doesn't surprise me when we are con- when we are given this kind of a piece, f- especially from the standpoint that that uh, Jim Butcher does kind of make an indication that there are people who have some natural ability, some natural talent yeah. mm-hmm. to make these, to touch these things and to, and to be a little bit more in tune with what's going on. It's for me, it's super easy to buy, especially because in the rest of the world, I mean, look at Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods has some natural sure. ability with golf. I play a lot of golf. Tiger Woods plays a lot of golf. He plays a lot more golf than I do, mm-hmm. but oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't think no matter how good I get, I'm ever going to be a Tiger Woods. That's not what I heard. I heard that you and Tiger Woods were the same. That's what I just heard. So I did. I, I will. <laughs> I will confirm at one point in time, I did go into a restaurant. And when they asked me for my name, I gave them the name of Tiger Woods. And when they called for my, they said, Tiger Woods, your reservation is ready. I, I watched people's heads swivel all over the place. It was awesome. My brother used to like to go into Jamba Juice and tell them that his name was Chewbacca just to see people's heads turn when they called out his name. <laughs> what? Really? Sorry. Tangent. We're coming back. You're welcome. Um, so so as far as as far as Victor Sells <laughs> learning magic, was there anything that was really specific laid out? No. Monica gives us a little bit of an indication. But is there something special about what's going on in Chicago? Um, the fact that the Arcane newspaper, which is publishing, uh, New York has the Inquirer, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the and the New York Daily News. Obviously, the Arcane is on a level of that, but it is focused around not UFOs uh, and not Hitler clones, but on 
arcane, uh, magic, werewolves, all those kinds of things popping up. So, yeah. so I think that's I, I think that that sets the stage for Chicago being somewhat of a nexus uh, for where some of this stuff ha- happens. Whether that is simple uh, storytelling convenience for Jim Butcher because he knows Chicago so well, or sure. if we're if he's going to create something about Chicago as a place that makes it work later on, don't know yet. I like to think of it as Chicago is just the coolest city, and so he had to base it there. But he he is from Springfield or or uh, Independence, somewhere in Missouri. So I mean, Chicago's right there. I'm sure he yeah. spent lots of time there as a as a kid. But Chicago's just a fantastic city. So. The fact that it was based in Chicago was instantly a draw for me. Yeah, well, we'll yeah. and maybe we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about that as we continue our series. I want to go back to Victor Sells just really quickly, because sure. and and step above level one for for just a second oh. because I you know I'm going to talk about this at some point. Well, yeah, but <laughs> so maybe we talk about it now. But uh, on first read through, I didn't catch it, but this second read through, I thought Victor really is a um, he's an example of what can happen if you're not hairy, if you're not good of heart or, or chivalrous or. <laughs> well, and if you haven't studied well, it, with anybody who knows anything about yeah, it. Yeah. Or if arrogant. you haven't had a, a mentor, which, which he has. And, and it says clearly in the book, he's good of heart. He is as cynical and as, as sardonic as he may be. He is, he is good of heart. He is a good person, even if he doesn't want to put that, that front on. And, it, it says very clearly that Harry, the level of magic that he knows, he doesn't display it really in this, but the level of magic that he knows, he could go dark very quickly and really, you know, wreak havoc on wreak the magical havoc, world. Yes, uh, based on, on the level of magic he has. And Victor is kind of a cautionary tale of if you if you don't have a good heart, if you're not Harry Dresden, you know, type yeah. level of good, this is what happens. This is what Harry could have been. If, you know, he wasn't good and if he didn't have a good mentor, who we in? We'll get to that. Yeah, we got to get to we'll that. We'll get to that. Megan, so, did, anyway. anything that you thought would thought about on that? No, nope, she's I'm smiling. Good. She's smiling. So, <laughs> you know, as long as we've as long as we've said, let's I think we can all agree that this on a level one, this is a ripping good yarn and it's lots of fun. And yes, and we have a good time with it. Um, level two, uh, as far as social commentary and some of those kinds of things, we find some level two things popping up in here. This story about third eye. And about what can happen to you when you and and whether he's whether he's doing a moralistic tale or he's just using it as a uh, as a writing convention because he needs part he needs something to involve organized crime and you know third eye is competing with crack cocaine or whatever is going whatever the or meth whatever the drug of the of the of the time was yeah. um, he's he's woven that piece in as well to you know to but it, but it feels like it's more a more a plot device than necessarily a commentary but from a level three standpoint what a there were some moments that were absolutely beautiful about family and about how important family and innocence are Mm -hmm. for harry um there's a there's the moment when he looks at the little girl um after hearing the whole story and Monica says, I'm afraid. And he talks about the, the, the wizard stare that he can see into your soul, soul and that gaze. you can see back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's careful about what he allows and, and about how long and what he knows and what he reveals, right? But as he looks at Monica, he realizes, oh, she was abused yeah. and she married someone who has abused her more. So I think, you know, Victor, and, and we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit more about Victor and, and some of those things as we move on. But as he as he works through this and he starts to see that these children are still innocent and that well, everything he's starting to realize that there's something wrong. There is something wrong. She can recognize it, that, but but she's still innocent. Yeah. She's still um, safe um, and that it's all about this love, a love that Harry himself has never been able to really have. Because mm-hmm. his mom died uh, when he was very young, and his father right. died when he was still quite young, mm-hmm. and so this this feeling of belonging, of having a family, and of the strength and the support and the protection that family can give, we get that one. We get the one glimpse when he is uh, when his mom pulls him back, yeah. um, and and in the narration. 
Um, if you if if you've never bought an audiobook, if you've never bothered to get involved in the audiobooks, um, I would encourage you to to take some time because there are some really wonderful wonderful performances done on these. In this particular one, uh, do you remember this? Do you remember this part, Ken? Where I'm listening to it and I'm I'm not sure, but it sounds to me like. Uh, like James is starting to cry while he's reading that portion about his mom and about his about finally being able to understand his dad and what drove his dad. Right. There. It, I I remember the part you're talking about, but I don't I don't remember thinking of it that closely. However, I I do remember thinking that he and this is talking about the narration again. James Marsters does a great job of conveying that yeah. emotion he yeah. conveying the gravity of what's what's going on inside harry at the time and i i don't know if i i heard that you know deep uh, level of emotion but yeah i mean it was absolutely really wonderfully did done. a good job of, of emoting really mm-hmm. wonderfully done and and it, it 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 whether or not this whether or not this uh level three piece of the importance of family and the importance of protecting innocence mm-hmm. um is is going to be something that is going to flow through the book series. I I feel like it is, um, but but whether or not it is, I think it was it was very much present in this, and I liked that. Um, there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of moralistic preaching going on in this book, but it felt very much like there was a there's a a feeling that that Harry has that innocence is to be protected mm-hmm. and families carry tremendous power and i i i really was touched by that i really enjoyed it i like um, that a lot it it for me that weaves in through the the three eye potion yeah where harry is able to look into the other world without having to take that potion and yeah. he sees it and he's even he's seen it before and he's still horrified he says these are things that you can never it's not going to be dulled by time you can't unsee you can't them. unsee it yeah and well, and even he runs into the man, or well, I guess the uh, the guy runs into him in the police station who has taken the potion and mm-hmm. Harry Dresden, you evil wizard, horrifying, yada yada yada. And Harry realizes this is real, but this man took this potion, drug, whatever we're calling it, without being prepared, having no idea what it was, and now his eyes are opened, and he can never unsee it, and he's yeah. always going to be tainted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it'll drive you mad. Even even Harry says it'll drive you know wizards mad yeah. if they stay uh, looking into it too often. Yeah, let's. I wonder if that whole potion was mostly a device to just introduce the idea of being able to look into. I would be sad if that were true. Yeah, but it it would be an interesting way to kind of introduce that. I mean, I, you know, I guess if if bring it, back down to level one. If it was, <laughs> well, that's fine. It's fine. You know, we can't stay on level three forever. If if you I stay like on level three. three I love level three, but but uh, I'm, and I'm sure some of our listeners do too. But I think uh, if if you spend all your time talking about level three, then it becomes a very different kind of a podcast. It's true, um, but so, someday we will melt Ken's cold so, dead heart. <laughs> so let's that's, that's impossible. Let's bring it back and, <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about some of the other plot devices that he uses. Um, if if third eye is a plot device mm-hmm. uh, that is just used to be able to introduce the wizarding, and I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Um, I think it's a plot device used to used to make a, a strong connection to the underworld, to, right? To the well, to, to the, the never never, yeah, to the never never, and to the mob. To the mob. The I was oh, thinking yeah, yeah. about the. I yeah, was yeah, thinking yeah. more about the which, mob, it, which is again yeah, a kind of fun bad. juxtaposition of the magical and the real world. Quote, yeah, quote, real world. Yeah, um, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm totally willing to let that happen, mm-hmm. and maybe we never see it again. I, I'm okay with that. Um, I have the feeling though, that, that having introduced it, we're probably going to see it again. Probably. <laughs> um, so let me ask a question of Read you guys. And find out. <laughs> so let me ask a question to you guys. We'll, we'll do this question and then maybe we'll go back to another question from our, from our Reddit thread. Cool. Um, what character other than Harry Dresden, as we start to read these, are you interested in learning more about and you're hoping that he explores more fully? Now, you guys have both read a little bit more, and so you may already have some glimpses into this, but from a character standpoint, what characters do you want to make sure and and that you hope he, he's going to really devote some time to? Megan, you go first. I find Morgan annoying. Uh, <laughs> my... Let's talk about Morgan. <laughs> Morgan. Yeah. I feel like Morgan, Morgan is and kind his ponytail. of... 
well, I find that he is kind of convenient where he comes in. He's like, I'm sure you murdered these people and I'm convening the white council. And I'm sure it's you because I follow you around. I haven't seen you do it, but I'm sure, you, you know, and then he comes in. But these after things he's are figured happening out, and I know right, it's you. After he's figured out, and you know, I was thinking about this on the drive up here. After he's figured out that it's the storm is the key. And so that's when Harry's killing. And so then he's like, can he be invisible? Is he always there physically? He's you know, so he's standing there watching. He goes, okay, fine. Harry didn't do it. I guess I'll save Harry. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm going to eat crow now. I think he's just a guy, but a really dense, overzealous guy guy who was he's really like, good with a sword he's like the gregory goyle of the never never kind of <laughs> like that's that. a harry potter reference <laughs> kind of uh, yeah one of malfoy's idiot but he people yeah i mean he's just he's he's a warden he, he's i mean his whole guiding star is is upholding the law without really thinking about the law you know what i mean uh, and, yeah yeah i'd buy that I, I i see morgan as um i see i see morgan as a uh, as the blunt instrument uh, that executes the law, not that not that interprets or uses the law. And I yeah. don't know if I necessarily need the character to be to be more fleshed out, but I just want a better understanding of what he does. Okay, and maybe how he does it. But okay. I I just I do want to know more about him. I wouldn't okay. mind seeing uh, if different wardens are more interesting as characters. <laughs> Uh, Mtal, I don't know how to say this on Facebook or on, on Reddit. Uh, M-T-A-A-L is the name. Mtal, we're going with that. Okay. Uh, actually asks about Morgan. Says, uh, says, I found his attitude towards Harry extremely irritating. That's what we were talking about. Amen. Uh, amen. Uh, do you hope to see more of him later in the series? Absolutely. Uh, I think we need him. I think, I think we do too. But like I said, I, I would he's, like to he's, see. He's kind of a nice foil wardens. for Harry. Yes, he is. He's yeah. a perfect, well, I, I was thinking the same thing. He's a good foil. Yeah. He's a perfect foil because where Harry works in shades of gray mm -hmm. and is about the two worlds kind of overlapping each other, Morgan is very solidly in the magic world. Yeah. He's, he doesn't care about, he doesn't care about investigation. He doesn't care. He looks at things and he says, ah, the only person that I know that can do magic is Harry. So it's got to be Harry that's doing magic. It's broken right. the rules too many times. So sentence is death. Yep. I'd be interested to see those rules too. We know, we know that yeah, number one is- Number one is you can't use magic to kill unless it, it's to save your own life or to prevent the deaths of others. Right. Um, Number four is you can't bind somebody against their will. Something, Yeah. And I don't know what two or three is or how many there are. Oh. I can't you remember, shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but will I? But fairies are not people. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> toot toot. Toot toot. <laughs> I, I, kept, I didn't think of that. I kept thinking to myself, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be going to, I, I, the next time that I go to a yard sale, I'm going to see if somebody's got a Barbie tea set that we might be able to use. Let's oh, see what one. we can do. <laughs> I mean, it's plastic what, and it's pink. But what would you do with that tea I have set? not thrown out any mm. of my stuff. I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying that. A lot no. of Barbie cars. So, um. Any other characters that we're that we're looking for? I would love to know more about Mac. That's the one That's that I wrote down. That's the one I figured you were going. Yeah, down. I um, <laughs> there was who else was the other one? I th I think Mac was the one that I I thought of the most. I would love to know more about Mac. And uh, I feel like I should be all girl power and say I'd like to know more about Murphy, but I feel like she's already wonderfully fleshed out, and I know we're going to know more about. Yeah, her. we are. We're gonna we're gonna learn a lot more about Murphy. Um, and, and it looks like we're going to learn a lot more about Susan too, because it yes. sounds like it, it and, and I, I'm reading this and I'm saying to myself, oh crap, we're going to have a, we're going to have a romance triangle here at some point in time. I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of hoping that it, when it does, it's believable and realistic rather than contrived and just right. thrown in. And again, like they're all grown ups. They're not 17 year olds. Right. Which helps. A lot. In yeah. fact, we. But then we already... Harry is just so awkward and does things so oddly. <laughs> which I can, uh, chivalrously. Which yeah. I can see being uh, a trait that somewhere along the line becomes endearing. Yeah. Um, to some of these other characters, and so it's going to be interesting to see what goes on with that. But you're right. I can. I, I you and I know each other pretty well, and so I'm glad that you picked up on the fact that I want to know about Mac. Yeah. I when he was when he was reading about uh, when when I was when I was going through and reading about Mac the first time. Um, a couple of things just just jumped to my head. 
one of them was Mac doesn't say much. No. <laughs> oh. He doesn't, he doesn't need to. Yeah. Okay, for a second, I couldn't think of who Mac was. Thank He's you. The He's the bartender. He's the yes. bartender. Yeah, I, yes. But and Mac strikes me as uh, the muggle in this wizarding world. He understands yeah. that it exists, and he is more than willing to figure out a way to make it work for everybody else around him. Leave, kind of leave him out. But let's, you know, let's let's figure out a way to let's figure out a way that we can all kind of live with yeah. each other. Mac doesn't take sides. No, nope. he's the patron of uh, Casablanca. Yeah, so. yeah, oh, sure. yeah. Beautifully said. Beautifully that's that's said. what he is, and and it's neat. You know, he, he's to have the gruff. You, you got to have in a story like this. You got to have the gruff, tacit. You know, uh, 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 what side character? I don't know how. What you, else to say? You, uh, yeah, you need somebody. Called. You need somebody that is that is uh, that Reliable. is grounded. Yeah, yeah, that is well grounded. And Mac is very well grounded. So. And and he and has plus. that's what I was looking. At. Nothing nothing phases nothing him. Nothing phases him. Yeah. Nothing phases him. So yeah, I'm <laughs> hoping that we get to learn a little bit more about Mac uh, and about his bar and about how it came to be and put it into place. Yeah. Um, and isn't that nice that his car didn't break down? <laughs> that was another thing I really enjoyed about this magic system is that electronics just go that, haywire. That's one of my favorite things about this magic system because then it talks about we because always he get really into has the to science rely on... versus the the technology versus yeah. versus magic uh, thing and. Yeah, you know, in, in every fantasy uh, series, we talk about that, and especially Harry Harry Potter. I'm like, well, I, I realize that you can talk to each other through fireplaces, but they have these things called phones. Yeah, yeah, you it's, know, it's it's kind of interesting, and maybe like, that's an accepted piece that if you're using magic, you can't use. Well, some Harry of the Potter maybe. takes place in the 90s. Just keep that in mind. But that still, that's the time frame. You yeah. still have telephones. I know. In fact, I we know. still had cell phones in the 90s. Yeah. Some of us did anyway. Well, I don't have a, this is not a Harry Potter discussion. No, it's not. But I, <laughs> my, my point I have being, no though, that, comment at all this right, time. All um, right. My point being, though, that, that this, <laughs> this series gives us a good reason why magic users don't use technology. Sure. Yes. It disagrees. Because so many things them. could be so yeah. much easier if he could just pick up the phone. Yes, exactly. And, and so. And he can't. Which is awesome. Um, do you have something else? No, I was going to say let's let's take another. Should uh, we should we go a little bit deeper into uh, Harry's chauvinism slash chivalry? Sure, uh, chivalism. Nope. Okay. Chival chivalism. I don't know. Chivalism. I got. Chauvin I got nothing. Chivalry. Krampus nope. rumpus. I'm going with that. Krampus rumpus says. Uh, so <laughs> I always have torn feelings on this series. Like I always love the combination of genres and the film noir and fantasy genres mesh so well in this series that it was an instant love. But Harry, the protagonist, is absolutely a chauvinist. And the way Butcher covers women is either uh, as either victims or a harpy or a sex kitten. Uh, I know it's written in later books that uh, we know it's bad, but he also doesn't learn. He just doesn't change. And at some point, the, the commenter stops stops empathizing with Harry because he doesn't change. And I, and another one asked if we had a problem with that necessarily. And you know, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's a good thing Craig's not here, you know, so otherwise he'd have to sit down. I'm not, I'm not the most chiv chivalrous member of the panel. I, I'm, I, you know, might be seen to, to more chauvinistic, you know, I'm so proud of you. You've come the... so far in your sense of self awareness. Thank you, Ken. I'm just, I'm just saying. But <laughs> I'm not that chauvinistic. I'm more chivalrous. Anyway, in this, this group, how did this become about me? You're it the was, one talking. It was just oh easy, Ken. It was just easy. I hate you all so much. Ah, I support you. I support you as you try to finish this thought. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now you know what Craig deals with all the time. All right. So anyway, um. I, I don't necessarily relate to him in terms of the, the chauvinism or, or anything like that. And, and I don't, I don't see it as something that I have to, I have to hate the, the character whole cloth because of, you know what I mean? It, it, every, every friend that you have, every person that you associate with is somebody who they have something that you just go, I disagree with you on a fundamental level about that, but I still like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, and and Harry, I mean, you look at the things that he does well, and you know, again, kind-hearted nature. So he's got a little bit of a chauvinistic streak in him. Or, or, well, and I, it sounds like the the commenter is complaining kind of about Butcher and the way he handles, uh, he handles how women are portrayed. Also, I think that I think that he does a fairly decent job. I mean, Murphy is 
a Mur- capable. Murphy is a, not only a strong, strong woman. capable yeah. woman, but she is also she also kicks his butt. Yeah. Um, and is willing to uh, put principle above friendship in a lot of situations, and and is portrayed. I and I don't see her necessarily being portrayed as a harpy, although you know we kind of get a we kind of get a glimpse of you know her her ex husband. She she makes the comment uh, about mm-hmm. you know does anybody ever say this about you? Yeah, my ex husbands do. Um, well, and and Murphy not so much, but Susan. I mean, she's she's capable and and you know independent, but yeah, she's very flirtatious and she's very sex kitteny. And yeah. in this genre, that's part of the genre. Yes. If we're talking about Mickey Spillane film noir, um, gumshoe detective novels, that's part of the genre. And so, from my standpoint. I'm looking at it and saying Jim Butcher is doing a wonderful job of combining the gumshoe detective novel with a with a with a fantasy element and putting them together because they sure. belong together. They, well, they don't belong together, but that piece but they, they mesh so well together, and it certainly belongs as part of that. So, from that standpoint, do I fault Jim Butcher for not making his hero for not making the gals in these stories uh, more fleshed out human beings up to this point in time? Not at all. Do I expect that we'll see something different? Absolutely. That's yeah, that and that's why I was going to say for one book I can I can set it aside for one it and if it continues on through fifteen books and and whatever and you know and, and even if it things does. don't change well even if it does I mean maybe but maybe it grows tiresome but maybe maybe he learns and evolves and and that becomes you know a little bit of a grown up thing but it certainly is part of it certainly is part of the gumshoe detective novel genre it's it's a it's a set piece for gumshoe detective detective pieces and so you know what i look at this and say you know i think he's i think he's doing a, a poor job of representing women and women's issues i would respond and say it's not his point he's yeah. trying to he's trying to do he's it's, trying to write a gumshoe detective novel where the gumshoe detective doesn't necessarily use a, a, a gun every time he turns around he's going to use a straw from a broom this is definitely the opposite of message fiction yeah yeah absolutely i'm really enjoying the you two men who are just so <laughs> upset that the women don't get to be stronger and uh, gain the sh- well. I I wasn't bothered by the chauvinism in this story, mostly because it is first person. And I'm not gonna lie, if I see a cute guy in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. I feel like that's what Harry Dresden is doing. And now I feel and- very comfortable around you all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't say it out loud, but I do think it, Todd. Thank you. I appreciate that. You may that. not be able to see in the mirror, but I can see you. Um, yeah. I'm not Medusa. I didn't turn you to stone. You're welcome. So. Um, no, but I I feel like they're, these women are in a good direction to be very fleshed out. I feel like they have their strengths. Yeah. They're very, the two that we know the most of right now are Susan and Murphy, obviously, they're two very different women. They're physically very different. Their personalities are very different. Murphy's, and their aims are very different. Right. And Murphy, a lot of Murphy's power is through working really hard and her physicality. And she's a judo champion and can fight. And it's just really scrappy. And then you've got Susan, who knows how to use her good looks to her advantage. But she's also very smart. She's her very calculating. Wiles. The part where yeah. she says... Harry Dresden, you didn't look down my dress one or down my yeah. blouse once during all of this, did you? And he's like, <laughs> like nope. Yeah. And then he's like, yep. but hormones only get you so far. So I look <laughs> now. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. But for me, coming as first person, it doesn't really bother me so much. If it was, you know, just some overarching narrator, third person narrator. I've lost track of my persons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who's describing women this way that might bother me more. Yeah. Yeah. But I I feel like he's just a human being. He didn't grow up with a mom. He didn't grow up with sisters. He's just doing the best he can. Um, And, and he's, and he is admittedly awkward. Yeah. So yeah, we deal with that. He embraces that. So we're, we're coming to the, we're coming to close to the close. Let me, let me ask two questions that are combined into one. Number one, who would you recommend this novel for? And number two, uh, what are you looking forward to the most in the next novel? Of course, you guys know what's coming. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna struggle a little bit with this one, but that's that's the question. I've already forgotten the first question. Who would you recommend this to? Oh, I would recommend this to. I want a specific person. I would recommend this to um, John Carl. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> good old John Carl's bad. I like that guy. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. You go first. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody who likes good action, who basically enjoys a turn off your brain and and enjoy a book. People um, who are not people. annoyed by magic in their books, who like superhero yeah. kind of. And, it, and it, that doesn't mean this has nothing to make you think. It just means that it's a, this is a very, this is a very sugar pops book. If we're going yes. with cereal, you know, and a ripping good yarn, it's a ripping yeah. good yarn. There you go, Todd. But it, there's something of substance in it, but mostly it's just a fun, it's just a fun 300 pages. It's yeah. not. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think for me, um, I, this is, this is the kind of book that if somebody is saying, you know, I don't always get into these fantasy books, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, what, what would you say if there was a, if there was a wizard walking down the street in our, in our day and they would say, oh, I think that was stupid. <laughs> hey, take a look at this book and see what you think. Um, but I think I also would not recommend this to somebody who was saying, man, I love how so-and-so can just really flesh out all of the political, social, economic problems that are facing a world situation, yeah. blah, blah. I yeah. I I think this is uh, unless they're looking for a palate cleanser um if if somebody wants really heavy meaty weighty stuff they just uh, in if their they're novels, on a long flight and they just want something fun to read to There you go. Yep. That's what this is. To, there this, you go. This book is not woke. No. <laughs> it was written in 2000. And yeah. very little was. And let's be honest too, um the the language is is one of the things that I love about Brandon Sanderson books is that I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about telling anybody about language. Yeah. In this one, my I was listening to the last couple of chapters at the house while I was doing some cleaning, and I had my speaker going. And my wife had to come in and say, okay, turn it down, turn it down, turn yep. it down, because Aww. we have she, she and I have different views on okay. language sure. uh, in our books. And so she would, you know... My wife will probably never read these books. Right. Well, Unless and there's I can not find the that much of it, version. but it is there. This yep. is not Lies of Locke Lamora uh, level language. Yeah, this is not Infinity Wars. Harry no. Harry Dresden, yeah. Harry Dresden will drop an F-bomb, and Jim Butcher will describe you some nudity. Yes, he will. But Yes, he will. But, but it's, the, it's not over the top. But there it's was not. no gratuitous sex. It's no. not like it was a porn book, and it's not like it was it was designed for that kind of a uh, that kind of a model. But it's but it's a grown up book. Yeah, it's a grown up book. It is. I wouldn't listen to this with my kids in the room. What's making sure. you look forward to the next ones? Um, I, I don't know what I can say. Okay, since, I know, since right? both of since both of you have already I'm, gone forward, let me say what I'm looking. What are you forward looking to. forward to? Yes, the next Todd. Time. What are you looking forward to? I'm looking forward to learning more about how he fleshes out the magic system. Hmm. I I want and and part of this probably comes we mentioned I I said we might touch on this earlier I've I watched the entire Dresden Files uh, television series. Let's talk about that for just one second. Um and number one the character that they used uh, or the actor that they used is not Harry Dresden. No, it was, that was a disappointing. It, it, they used Paul Blackthorne. If anybody's seen the Arrow series, uh, he's uh, Quentin Lance. Yeah, and if you uh, saw Twilight, he's Bella's dad. There you go. You're welcome. Uh, He's a so, yeah, wonderful actor, of you. Yeah. wonderful actor, but he's not like six foot two and he's not he's, tremendously he's lanky. Not, well, and he, he doesn't he, have he long was too hair old for the role. He was, too, yeah, he just, it wasn't right. There's, there's a couple of things that made, that made him not the right fit, uh, as far as what Jim Butcher was writing. However, yeah. I think he captured the character very, very well. Um, I, I had an easier, I enjoyed the, the television series as a, as, as kind of, and a biz bush, uh, as a as a delight. Can you see? Yes, and I a said that. Bush? A moose bush. <laughs> a moose bush. Thank you. Did that just a give biz us, bush? A moose bush. Did that just give us an explicit bush. rating on this? Podcast? I don't know. Did it? <laughs> well, just, Craig's just laughing at me because he's saying you were speaking gibberish. Um, a moose bush. That's yes. gibberish. G <laughs> um, it's a, it was it was very much about getting some uh, about about making me want to have more of Harry Dresden. And so as mm. I go back and I look at the at the way that the series ran, the series did not address the same kinds of stories, at least mm. not as I re recall, uh, not that I've seen so far. Um, but they were very they were very much in the in the uh, in the in the vein, and they did a wonderful job of representing them. Yeah. So I I think that um, if if you enjoy the the books, um, you probably will you probably would be not disappointed in this series in the television series. But there are things that you're going to be absolutely disappointed in the casting. Morgan was totally cast was cast completely differently. Um, yeah. 
the but but there's a there are some elements that I already have as part of having watched that that I'm anxious to see how it was done in the books. Yeah. And so I'm I'm looking forward to and one of those is the fleshing out of the magic system. Oh, and these these books are written episodically. So I mean they would make fantastic uh, yeah. fantastic television series in or fact. Or mini series. After uh, after we get through Full Moon, um we'll have to talk about cuz I'm I'm casting these books in my head as I go. And so okay. af- after yeah. we get done Am with- I Murphy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> of course you are. I've seen you kick butt. That one time. That one time. That one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Craig never knew what hit him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and any- I'm this is my last episode. Thanks everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that's so okay. After... Craig's too busy looking at, at at football scores at the moment. Orbital kinetic weapons. Orbital kinetic, Orbital kinetic Ooh, weapons. I need to get that. I need that. All so, right. So yeah, well, after we when we get into full moon, I'll, we'll talk about casting a little bit because because I, I've got some ideas. But anyway, yeah, I think this this book series can make it a, a fine, fine for like you know if you do the short half season. Um, uh, shows, you know, so you storm fronts the first eight episodes or whatever, and then full moons, the next eight episodes. Oh, and, sure. Or if you do it like BBC America and you just, or BBC and you just, yeah, just like have each three, book take two episodes and yeah, three big episodes forward. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It, All right. They're, they're built for that. But anyway, all right, well, let's, uh, let's put a bow on this one and call it done. Episode 199 of the Legendarium podcast is coming up next week. Uh, that is going to be those dirty red teamers who are going to be doing Republic of Thieves, book three in the Gentleman Bastard series. And then episode 200. Oh, yeah. We're not sure what we're going to do for that one yet, but guaranteed it is going to be awesome. It'll, it'll be amazing. You may we're... not have fun, but we definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> there, there will be drinking. And there will probably be insults <laughs> aplenty. So anyway... <laughs> <laughs> it, but it's all going to be Coke Zero and... Yeah, and, what are you drinking right now, Ken? Um, it's diet. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for being here. We'll <laughs> see you next time on the Legendarium Podcast. You're listening to the Legendarium Blue Team. Welcome. (laughs) You said more commercial.